Hi, uh, good evening and welcome to our third Thursday uh, Vet Chat program. Um, today's program is being recorded live and can be shared on our website or on YouTube or other social media platforms. If you want to view it again or see some of our past programs, you can find them there. Vet Chat gives you, our audience, a chance to chat with uh, one of our veteran volunteers. It's not really an oral history, but I do interview them, um, kind of giving a survey of their service, but then open it up to questions and an opportunity for you to uh, ask any questions you might like. And the only crazy question is the one you didn't ask. Um, but unlike a normal webinar in our Zoom culture these days, we've turned off the chat feature. So if you wanna post questions, use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Uh, likewise with Facebook, um, we're monitoring Facebook Live so you can post your comments there and uh, I'll see them and we can ask. I'll do as many as best I can to get as, to as many questions as possible, kind of about a half an hour to 40 minutes of a kind of a basic interview and then open it up to questions, but uh, fire away as soon as your curiosity strikes. Um, at the end of today's program, there's going to be a brief survey where you can post any additional comments or if you have some feedback. Um, if you're on Zoom, that's going to pop up automatically at the bottom. If you're in Facebook, it's going to be in the comments section. So have a look for that at the end. Um, if you're joining us for the first time, welcome. And if there's anyone out there from uh, the Intrepid Volunteers Group, our friends down at the Memorial Foundation in DC, or anyone uh, who might have served with Joe on uh, the grand old CV-66 USS America, let us know. Joe Rosado, welcome to Vet Chat. Hi, Mike. Uh, thank you for having me here. Joe, why don't you just uh, tell us what branch of the service you were in? I'm, maybe I gave the baby away with the bathwater there, but uh, what was your rank and uh, what years did you serve? Okay, I, uh, I served in the U.S. Navy uh, from uh, December 7th, 1966 uh, until January 20th, 1970. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, my rank only was a seaman. I didn't make much of a rank. I, uh, just before I, I uh, got out of the Navy, I did make uh, E-4 Petty Officer Boson May 3rd class, but uh, we can get to that reason why I, I never got to wear that rank, uh, but uh, that's where I served. And uh, the USS America was my uh, final uh, two years of service in the Navy. Well, where did you grow up? Where was home? Uh, home was uh, Brooklyn, New York, uh, the Gravesend section of Brooklyn, uh, which is uh, just uh, north of Coney Island. Uh, a lot of uh, my childhood was spent in Coney Island. Uh, all my jobs uh, while I was going to school uh, were in, most of them were in Coney Island. Um, and uh, I went to a very big high school, uh, Lafayette High School in Brooklyn, New York, uh, which had uh, quite a few thousand students at the time. Mm. And uh, one of my teachers in that high school uh, is responsible for having me join the Navy. Yeah, how did that come about? Uh, well, uh, he was a gym teacher. His name was Mr. Bloom, and uh, he was a World War II submariner who, wow. served, who served in the Pacific during the war. And we know that those guys did not have an easy time about that. And uh, he used to talk to us about his service in the Navy, and, and you know, we didn't pay much attention to him and sort of, eh, yeah, 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 right on. And you now I graduated in June of 65. and. Uh, I, I finally got into the workforce and uh, there was a tough kid in the neighborhood uh, who joined the Marines uh, in June of 66, he was killed. And um, that sent a shockwave through the neighborhood and the Vietnam War was more frequently in the news. It was everywhere you, you could see. And, and I said to myself, you know what? Maybe I should go see Mr. Bloom at Lafayette High School and I did and uh, he made a quick phone call and uh, got me in for an interview and I was interviewed and it happened to be December 7th and there was a big celebration for the 25th anniversary of Pearl Harbor so I couldn't join it a better day. Wow wow huh. um, tell me though I want to hear more about that that's a very auspicious day to, <laughs> yes. to join the Navy indeed yes. but um, growing up in your uh, 
the gentleman who was from your neighborhood and the Marines who had been killed. Until that moment, had you been sort of following the increasing, you know, yes. military? Well, on, yeah, on, on television, you know, when I first was in, when I was in high school, Vietnam was coming up every now and then in the news. And I, you know, I, to be honest with you, I didn't even know where Vietnam was and uh, I couldn't really care where it was. It was a, looked like it must've been a little country somewhere and who knows where, and I'm, I wasn't interested in it. But uh, having uh, the, the, this neighborhood guy get killed all of a sudden made it more real. And, and then the, uh, by 66, the escalation of the draft and all that came into play big time and uh, things were happening and, uh, you had to do something or else uh, you were going to go. And there wasn't much of a choice. You know, either you you waited to get drafted or you enlisted like I did, or you uh, went to Canada like some did. And, and and then there were some 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 young men that uh, at the time whose families could afford to send them to school and college. And uh, you had college deferments. And, and, and you know, it was to a totally unfair system, to put, to put it lightly, to draft. And uh, that, that, that didn't work out too well and eventually changes were made. Yeah. Well, being from New York, um, do you have a, a draft subway token story? Yes, yes. When, you, uh, when I did join the Navy uh, on December 7th, 66, two days later, I, I did receive my draft notice. But prior to that, I had to take a physical so you get a letter from your local draft board. Now my local draft board was in Coney Island and there's a picture on, on the mural and the memorial mm -hmm. uh, on, on that wall behind you, Mike. And, and it's a picture of, uh, they, they shown James Bond and Nathan's hot dogs. Oh, right okay. <laughs> that, yes. That, that picture was taken from the window of my draft board. Oh, and, that's cool. And uh, <laughs> so, um, you took your physical and then you received a letter in the mail. Uh, and in the left-hand corner of that letter, you could feel there were two metal objects taped to the letter. You opened the letter and, and it was two subway tokens, one to get you to the draft board to take your physical and another one to get you back home. And then when I joined the Navy, it was about 10 days, two weeks later, I, uh, I got my draft notice uh, and uh, I, I felt that left-hand corner and it only had one token taped to that letter, which meant that you weren't coming home for a while. So I told, I called the Navy and told them I've received this letter and they said, don't worry about it, just bring it with you and uh, we'll take care of it. So that's it. So did you go to the Navy receiving station uh, down along the waterfront in Brooklyn? Is that where yes, the speech yeah, was? I think it's Washington Avenue. Yeah. The, okay receiving station right at the gates of the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Uh, that, that, that's exactly where I went, right? And tell me, it, it was tell me active, more. It was an active place, the Brooklyn Navy Yard in those days. Oh, absolutely, It was, yeah. it was an active base and there were ships docked there and home ported mm -hmm. and, and the whole thing, so. Wow. Well, do you have any memories of, um, you joined on the 7th and you, you've shared, you've hinted when we, talked about that there was a, a speech about sort of the memory of World War II. I was just wondering if you could say a little bit more speech, about that. A speech about World War II? Well, uh, at the welcoming oh, the new... Um, oh, at Caesar's Palace? The, the new sailors. No, maybe I've, maybe I've got it wrong. Yeah, yeah, no. Yeah, never mind. I think you do. I <laughs> Strike <do>. that. <laughs> <laughs> well, so once you were in the Navy, uh, what type of duty were you hoping for? Well, what well, I... I uh, I, I originally joined the submarines and uh, I was in basic training in New London, Connecticut. And, uh, and I was about to be assigned to a boat and uh, I had to take a physical, one last physical. And they found that I had escalating blood pressure and it wasn't recommended that I go in the submarines. So mm -hmm. I was kind of disappointed and, uh, and, uh, they didn't know what to do with me, and they sent me to St. Albans Naval Hospital in Queens, and uh, I spent a few weeks there, and uh, they let me out, and they didn't know what to do with me. So they sent me to the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Uh, they sent me, and I was assigned to um, a destroyer, uh, the USS Bristol, uh, which was home ported in the Brooklyn Navy Yard, and it was a reserve training ship. So it looked pretty good, and you know, 
I didn't mind. I was close to home. Went home most any night and fine with me and 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 and, and my uh, my fiance, which became my wife. We actually decided, you know what? Let, we can plan for a wedding. This is not going to be too bad. And uh, we did plan for a wedding, and we got married. Uh, and uh, on January thirteenth, nineteen sixty-eight, uh, I was on a honeymoon, and uh, I received a, a notice that uh, the Navy needed to speak to me ASAP. Where were you on your honeymoon? Well, we took a two-leg honeymoon. First leg was San Juan, Puerto Rico. And, and, and we were about to go to New Hampshire skiing the second week. And uh, when I was leaving San Juan on the way to New Hampshire, uh, that's when I got noticed that uh, they canceled my leave. And uh, I had to report back to the ship and uh, wondering what was going on. And when I got there, I found out that uh, they were going to Cut me orders to um, to go um, to Norfolk, Virginia, and they were going to give me duty on the USS America. And I that was completely fabulous, like an aircraft. And I knew aircraft carriers when they left home port, home port, they hardly ever came back. So that was the first thing in my mind. I was worried, my God, I just got married. I'm never going to be able to see my wife. You know? <laughs> <laughs> right. So I got it that way. How so literally on the honeymoon, you get the notice and it's to report. Wow. So there was hardly any, any breathing time. No, no, no. They can't, yeah. they canceled my, I had leave. I had two week leave and a week was over and they said, yeah, we canceled all leave. And, and, and they did tell me when I got to the ship that, uh, have you been keeping track of the news? Uh, something called the Tet Offensive has taken place and, um, we need, we have to rejuggle everything. And, uh, and they, when I got to Norfolk, I was, it was explained to me that the uh, Vietnam War had to pick up it, its pace uh, for the Navy and all the aircraft carriers that were serving up until that point were based in the West Coast of the United States. So mm -hmm. they were overburdened and working too hard. So they wanted to transfer some Atlantic based aircraft carriers to serve in the war. And the uh, America was the second base aircraft carrier to go to Vietnam. I think the first was the USS Independence um, okay. was the first and we were the second. Now, um, I um, I know about the America's history, but I, I don't know how much of the, the that our audience knows that this wasn't just any aircraft carrier that it was flagged to be the flagship of the seventh fleet. Yes. Yes. We became you, the flagship of the seventh fleet. Yeah. Did you yeah. know that prior to departure that you were going to be? No, no, did not. And, and another thing about the America, another famous thing it took place on when uh, the Arab Israeli war was going on in 1967, I think it was. And the USS yeah. Liberty was bombed. Uh, it was the America that was there and, 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 and went what it thought was going to war. So these were all the shipmates told me the story when I got on board, oh, but you missed it, lad. we were here and we went to war and you know, I was like, wow. You know, but uh, that, that's the American that did that too. Uh, well, what was your first impressions of the America when you pulled up, uh, oh, saw her? Amazing. Uh, I don't know if the audience, somebody in the audience now have ever been close to an aircraft carrier, a super carrier. I should say, you know, the USS Intrepid in, in New York is, is, is an aircraft carrier, but it's a World War II vintage aircraft carrier. It's not a super carrier. But um, when you walk up and you're on a dock that's only a few feet above water and you look at this thing, it's just massive size, massive. And the hustle and bustle, the equipment, loading, unloading, people going up and down the planks, uh, elevators going up, planes being lifted on top of the deck from the pier. And that, that's what I saw. It was just massive confusion. Everything, everything was being loaded and hustle and right by. And uh, when I got there, they rushed me to the personnel department. And uh, that's when, you know, I, I, I kind of said, uh, where am I going to go? What, what am I going to do? And I had to change my rank, my rating. In the submarines and on destroyer, I was an electrician's mate. Now, uh, and all submariners have to know about electricity because uh, a submarine is an electric boat. And so 
they told me, well, you're going to be a bosun's mate right now. And, and, and uh, we, need, we need helmsmen and you're going to be trained to be a helmsman. And, and I said, the personnel officer, I don't really know much about driving an aircraft carrier. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, a submarine, I did it in stimulation and all that. But he said, well, it's a lot easier than a submarine. It has windows. And he told me and made that comment. And it was like, okay, here it is. So what am I in for? What was uh, setting out to war like? Was there a big send off for the carrier or was it done yeah, in secrecy in the dead of night? There were a lot of family dependents. There were a lot of lifers on board. So it, the lifers were the ones that their families lived there in Norfolk, where the home port of the ship is. So there was parades and bands and, and speeches and ceremonies for that day. And, uh, and then when it was time to go, it, it was a sad moment. You're watching, you know, I didn't have anybody there from my family, but just to watch, you know, a guy saying why, goodbye to his wife, his mother, his father, his children, and, and, and that. And, and, and it, it was kind of depressing to watch, but uh, you kind of felt the warmth of it. And, uh, and again, I say guys, because back then there were no women on ships. So it was all men, no women. Well, talk about the voyage to Vietnam. Yeah, it was a long one. Uh, and why was that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we, we, we had, had a little uh, disadvantage. We, we, we could not fit through the Panama Canal, obviously. Uh, so uh, the way to get to Vietnam uh, from uh, Norfolk, Virginia, is the long way. Uh, we left Norfolk and, and sailed south. Uh, I think we picked up our air wing out of Florida, Mayport. I think it was Mayport, Florida, and, and, and the rest of our air wing. And, 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 and then we continued to Rio de Janeiro. And I, I said to myself, you know what? This is not too bad, Rio. I'm just looking at Rio here. And then I noticed that they didn't tell us exactly where we were going to go after Rio. Uh, until we were at sea. And then when we left Rio, they said, well, we're, we're gonna go to uh, Cape Town, South Africa and stop mm -hmm. there. So um, that's, to me, that's sailing between Rio. And if you look at a map, it's exactly straight, straight line. And I think that's the biggest part of, uh, of no land sighting uh, that I, I ever see. There was nothing there, nothing but open waters for days and days. And uh, I do remember, I think I made a comment to you how, you know, in those days, I don't know if they do anymore, but they would, the open, they called it open the fantail when you threw all your garbage at the end, rear end of the ship, all the food waste, all the garbage would be thrown over in plastic bags. And uh, the Marines would uh, go to the back with their guns and they'd shoot the bag so they could fill the water and sink. Good turn. So, and they were watching, we'd watch all this and the Marines were having fun. And, and, and when they did that, it was amazing because here in the middle, let's say it was between Rio and Cape Town South in the middle of the South Atlantic, thousands of miles from anywhere. And all of a sudden, hundreds and hundreds of seagulls would show up. And I was just amazed, where did these birds come from? It, it just, you know, there was no land there. Yeah, but it, I had never seen and realized and could explain to myself where those birds came from, but they found it. They were following. Yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> sea is alive. Well, uh, there is a maritime tradition that happens for the uninitiated. <laughs> yes, yes, uh, yes. Why don't you tell us a little bit about the shellback ceremonies? Okay. When, when uh, you're in the Navy and your ship uh, crosses the equator, uh, there's a, a big initiation. And uh, it, it's basically the people who have crossed are called shellbacks and the people who have not crossed are called polywalks. So they just beat the hell out of you for, for that whole day when you're crossing the equator. But I was instru under instruction for the helm. So two or three days before that, my leading petty officer said to me, um, we need you to learn the helm. So I'm going to position you for the second, because we were going to cross the equator twice, once going to Vietnam and then coming back. So he says, you're going to be initiated on the way back, not the way going. 
So I, you know, I wasn't paying attention. I really wasn't thinking about it. I said, okay, man, no problem with me. But I watched the whole thing from the bridge and the bridge is in the conning tower. So you have this bird's eye view of what the heck's going on. And, and you see this initiation of, you know, again, it, it, it sounds silly to people that can't experience it, but they save up all the trash and the food waste for days and you walk to this muck and people dress up in pirates. They cut their uniforms and they, they, they take fire hoses and they use them as whips and, and you get, and, and there's no, no substitution that regardless what your rank is, you go through this initiation. So you, here he is, you see the captain getting wound the ship's chaplain getting left. So if you say they're doing it to them, can imagine what they're going to do to me. Then I realized, well, all these guys are going to be showbacks when we go home. So there were roughly 400 um, uh, uh, showbacks when we crossed and mostly everybody was polywaxed. Well, w when I was initiated coming back home, it was the opposite. It was 4,000 whatever and only mm -hmm. 400. Of, uh, of them and the, it didn't go well we really uh, it was black and blues for days and and then the, after it's all over this is the fun part they put you in a cargo net with 10 to 12 other guys and the cargo net picks you up and they dunk you over the side and there's sharks in the water and and from all the food waste and stuff dripping on you and the marines are there with their guns shooting and keeping the shocks away. So it was like, you know, this is it. That's the initiation. And you get a certificate, it's in your record and I have it on my wall right here, looking right at it right now. Oh, uh, nice. you know, from, from, from Neptunus Rex himself. Hmm. Well, you know, I think you've lived every boy's fantasy. You got to drive the ship. What was that like? <laughs> it, it was kind of neat, you know, thinking here I was 20 years old and I'm driving the biggest mechanical device on the planet. And there's over 5,000 people in it. And, uh, you know, I had good, good instructors and uh, it's very orderly. And uh, um, it, you feel like you're really on top of the world and that you're sitting on top of the world and you're driving this thing. But, you know, when you hear the old expression, oh, it takes longer, it, it, as long as a battleship turning, well, an aircraft carrier is a lot bigger than the battleship. So it actually takes forever to turn around. So we would never hardly ever, I don't think I've ever been on the ship when it actually had to turn around. Like, I think I explained to you, man overboard, the man overboard, we had a guy in my division that would jump over, that jumped over twice, not once. And, uh, and the ship doesn't turn around to go save you. Or an escort ship, you know, destroyers would go or helicopters would take off to rescue the person, but the ship never would turn around. And it mm -hmm. just doesn't do that. And, uh, you know, kind of big and uh, you're sitting on this thing and you're, you're paying attention. You, the wind, it, it plays an important part because during flight operations, you have to be exact. The planes can't take off the land unless they're going right into the wind. And you can't veer off a course one little hair and you can, you can cost somebody their life and, or many people that, for that matter. Was your air group practicing operations in route to Vietnam or were you just? No, or, no, well, yeah. I wasn't in the air group, I was in ship's company. So yes. Yes, I was ship's company. But the, the air wings are separate. Air wings, but okay. They, they, they were, there were some planes taking off. I don't know what they were, where they were going, but in the middle of nowhere, no, no, they weren't. Uh, and then we, we also picked up some additional uh, air wing, I think when we got to the Philippines before we went into the Gulf of Tonkin to pick up some more from uh, people, planes and things like that. Well, tell us about arriving in the Gulf of Tonkin and what, uh, what the Navy called that station. Yeah, okay, the Gulf of Tonkin was uh, broken down into two sectors. The uh, Yankee station was the one that I was in with the America and, and that was North Vietnam basically. And Dixie Station was uh, South Vietnam. And uh, North Vietnam, the Yankee Station was the bigger one. That's where all the action was. And when I, we got there in 68, um, give you an idea, there were five aircraft carriers operating in the Gulf of Tonkin at Yankee Station at all times. Uh, you know, uh, some famous ships, the USS Midway, uh, the, uh, the, the Kennedy came later, the uh, Kitty Hawk, the, uh, 
I'm looking at USS Range. I'm looking at my chart right here. I, I got patches from all those ships. Uh, the the Bonhan Richard, the Forrestal, all of them were were here. And here we are. We're with a flagship and and operations are working 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And an aircraft carrier in that group, uh, there were five. So every 30 days or so, one aircraft carrier would leave and we'd go take a little R and R. They we'd go to a, a nearby country and a replacement aircraft carrier would come in from Subic Bay in the Philippines to replace you for a few days. But you know, we would go to uh, we went to Hong Kong, we went to, uh, to uh, Japan, uh, and then uh, we went to Subic Bay a lot. And that was, you know, wasn't a pretty good place to go to, but it was, it still was another country. And it was a little more of a, you know, relaxation because you weren't in a war zone when you went there. Yeah. Uh, well, I want to, I want to, I want some, wouldn't be a Navy story if we didn't have some shore leave stories. <laughs> but um, thinking about, Going, uh, we've got a question here, uh, and it, it kind of intersects with what I wanted to ask you next. Was this is from our Michael Cole, and he says, "Being a little speck in the Pacific Ocean, was your mail service any better than we had on land?" Um, so, what was uh, if you wrote a letter home on board? How long would it take to get back to your wife in uh, Brooklyn? It, we had excellent mail service because of planes. We had these planes coming and going all the time. We were the um, distribution, it, while we were in the Gulf of Tonkin, we were also the distribution point for mail for other ships. So, uh, I mean, I, I, I recall letters that would arrive from my wife in four or five days, you know, which is a pretty amazing to think about, you know. But the mail service was excellent and uh, because we were an aircraft carrier, we had an advantage, and, and there's always planes coming and going. So, yeah, I, I can't hear you, Mike. How about hey, now? No, that's it. That's okay. okay. I was saying, I, I was surprised. I'm surprised to hear it was that fast. That's incredible. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, there's a lot of mail, so yeah, always had it, and everybody looked forward to that mail call. And uh, if you were busy, uh, you, it was uh, on your rack in your bed when you got back. That's where your mail was. Was there a steep learning curve, learning the, the activities on the bridge? Yeah, well, yeah. I, besides being a helmsman, I also, on the bridge, was a lee helmsman. I was a lookout. Um, and uh, you did a lot of things. And, and, and that's what is, a, what is a lee helmsman? Lee helmsman controls the speed of the ship. Okay, that's a thing. If bells go off, it's two handles, and it's a big round disc, and and two handles are the engine, you know, the the, the uh, prop. So there's two engines, and so to make a turn, a ship would have to you would have to go reverse in one side, and port engine and starboard engine. You you have to go forward, so the ship would be able to turn faster, and and like a boat, just the same principle and uh, look out and then you had, you would relieve each other and, you know, and then you'd have, you'd be in the position where you're in the oddball position, which was, if you wanted, you, if you smoked, you went on the catwalk and you smoked. Now I'd never smoked, so it didn't affect me, but I was just standing around. And if you were in that oddball position, uh, if the admiral or captain had to be woken up in the middle of the night, some, some event was taking place, you'd be that, that's the position. So you have to go to the admiral's uh, stateroom, two marine guards at his door. The captain had the same thing, and you'd have to ask permission for the marines to knock on his door, and he'd yell and scream and curse and rap, say, well, it's three o'clock in the morning, what are they all going to work <laughs> and, and then you know you have to tell the admiral your presence is 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 wanted on the bridge, and and that he'd have to get dressed because he just can't come in his bathrobe. He has to put on his full uniform. <laughs> and uh, and come up to the bridge and then find out what important thing uh, had to be done and uh, you know there was a there was a we called it the bat phone uh, there was a red phone uh, that the between the admiral and the captain and uh, and usually headquarters in Honolulu was calling and doing something and who knows what he had to do but anyway he wasn't happy when he had to be woken up. Uh 
I'm just going to announce to our audience that I'm definitely going to open it up for questions as we go okay. forward. I'll, I'll keep, I've got lots more myself for Joe. Uh, but I noticed that someone asked a question in our chat feature, and just a reminder out there to use the Q&A feature. That way it, uh, it can pop up on my screen here and it can be uh, easily uh, found by our folks running uh, behind the scenes. But uh, I'm going to just click on, oh, I, I, lost, I lost it. The, the question, though, um, the question was, and here it is, it's from a, a Joseph, um, and it says, if you can describe about operating during typhoon season. Okay. So were you on station during typhoon season? We, we had two in 68, two typhoons that affected us, I do remember, uh, that came close enough to affect us. And uh, for the benefit of those who don't know what a typhoon is, it's a hurricane in, in the Pacific. Um, the way we handled the typhoons was we ran from them. Uh, that's the best way. Okay, we would leave, stop all the bombing, middle, make range, and just if if it was uh, estimated it would be in a certain area, we would just get out of its way, and that was the way. Now there still was some rough seas that you get close because you can be hundreds of miles from a hurricane still get rough seas, but we really get rough enough that we're actually in the middle of a hurricane. They would never allow that to happen. But running it was the reason, and that's what you did. And if we had to leave Yankee Station, we left Yankee Station. Yeah. Were you at, uh, Were you ever in really rough weather yourself? Yeah, yeah, there was. That's coming home. Uh, the roughest waters of the world, uh, the uh, little uh, body of water between the tip of South America and Antarctica. It's uh, it's it goes to it's the Magellan Straits and then it has the Drake Straits. They call it two different names, but that's where the Atlantic Ocean meets the Pacific Ocean, and those are the roughest seas that, that anybody can imagine. It's always rough because of the elevation difference. The Atlantic Ocean has an elevation advantage over the Pacific Ocean, and that's why people that go to Panama through the Panama Canal have to go through a lock system, mm -hmm. uh, and because the uh, water in the Atlantic, I think it's 45 feet higher than the Pacific. So all that wow. takes place at the South Pole and the magnetic pole of the South Pole and the Atlantic meeting, the Pacific turns itself in and the, it's very, very rough and the ship prepares for it because it's like a countdown, a space launch. You know, you're so many hours, so, so many minutes away and uh, everybody that didn't have a, an essential role on the ship would have to go to their racks, tie themselves in. There was no, no food served for that period of time. Everything closed and all the planes were taken in to the hangar bay, elevated doors were closed. And I was at the helm when, when we would go through it. And uh, all I remember was a lot of rough seas, high winds, and this wave of water that the whole flight deck was covered with water for a few minutes. Uh, and to give you an idea, the height of a, an aircraft carrier is a couple, you know, 120 feet or whatever from water. So, you know, and then you pass through it and it's sunny, the birds are singing and, and it's over. And it's just like you went through a time tunnel. And, uh, you know, and, and you can understand the ancient mariner Magellan went through it, but if he had to go through it the opposite way, he went through it the easy way, his, it, it was lucky. But if he had to go around the world the other way, he, I don't think a wooden ship history, ever would have made it yeah, through History there. would be different. Wouldn't it? Yes, yes. We, we wouldn't be where we are today, probably. <laughs> well, um, I've got a question here, uh, and I, I think this kind of brings us back onto Yankee Station. Any threats from, this is from John uh, Nugent, any threats from the North Vietnamese by sea or by air when you were on station? No, no, the, the uh, Navy controlled the air and sea of yeah. the Gulf of Tonkin. So um, there was no question, it was probably the safest place to be when you served in a war. We were in a war zone, got you know uh, war pay and all that, but it was safe. Even submarines, uh, uh, aircraft carrier always has a submarine underneath it too. So it doesn't go anywhere without a submarine nearby. So th 
it's a very safe place. But we did have interference from Russians. There were Russian trawlers. They called them Russian trawlers. They were they were uh, radar jammers, or, or 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 they would try to spy, but they would disguise themselves to look like fishing vessels. And they were pretty big. They were probably 150 foot long, and they had all these these antennas and wires on them, and they would try to jam our radar and our radio co uh, communications between the pilots and, and the ship or, mm -hmm. or between our, our planes in the ship, uh, helicopters in the ship, they would do that. And they would try, they knew that the aircraft carrier, when it was in flight operations, couldn't change course. So we would try to get in our way and block us so we would have to shut down air operations, which we never did. But they would attempt it, and our, our, our uh, destroyers would run out and chase it and make some noise with them and then get them out of the way. Even some of the helicopters would chase them away, too. Wow. So, wow. They, they were really antagonizing. Yeah. Um, talk a little bit more about the air operations. I mean, you, you certainly had a bird's eye view of all the, the activity going on. What was the tempo of that? like on a daily basis. Very noisy. My, my sleeping compartment was, uh, I was in first division, bosun's mate, and I was right right behind the foxhole. Foxhole's enclosed on an aircraft carrier. But above me, where my sleeping compartment was, was the flight deck. And number the number one catapult was right over me. And and planes are, 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 are how they reach the speed to uh, fly is a catapult from zero to 200 miles an hour in, in, in a second and with the bombs and everything on it. So you can imagine this noise, we had some pretty big planes. We, we had, the biggest bombers we had were the F-4s and uh, they, they were nicknamed the, the flying elephants because mathematically an engineer could never explain why they flew, but because they were so powerful and their engines were so big, they flew. You know, but but we had A fours, A sixes, A sevens, and some vigilante uh, uh, planes. Uh, I forget what the name of them were, and uh, or radar planes and things like that. But it was a very noisy, noisy place. And uh, you know, uh, the, when they went out, they were fully lo loaded. Bombs would be loaded on the flight deck, and uh, and they take off. And we'd have. Uh, um, Three uh, three catapults and uh, and there's a tail hook when they come in. There's a there are three tail hooks which are cables and the, the perfect landing is you catch the first tail hook. The not so perfect landing is you catch the second tail hook and the mm, lucky landing is when you catch that last tail hook. And there were cases where sometimes because of wind shear and whatever the pilot decided he wasn't going to do it. So a pilot never shut the engine off until he was told to, there'd be a guy on the, I forget his position, but a guy on the flight deck in the air wing and he had flags and he'd cross his arms like this. So that told the pilot to cut the engine. If the pilot didn't see that, he had to step on it and take off again. And, and, and that's how they could take off without a catapult the second time because they're coming in for landing and they're never slowing down. Was, did your air wing on the America, did they suffer any losses um, Not, during its tour? Yeah, I don't think, we had a lot of air wings come and go uh, and, and a lot of air wings did different things. You know, the, the heavy bombing uh, with one air wing and, and the, the F-4s were a different air wing and whatever, but I don't think we lost any pilots uh, uh, in combat you're talking about, right? Yeah, right, yeah. Right. I think guys had to eject and, those kind of things, uh, their planes were, um, you know, uh, probably uh, malfunction or had damage in it or whatever. But I, I don't recall anybody ever saying that we lost any pilots. And we were an accident free. Our cruise, we finished that cruise with no accidents. Um, and, and, and records were set too. We, we set the bombing records. Uh, I think the biggest day we ever had was 292 tons of bombs in one day wow okay that, that's a lot of bombs that's yeah. a lot of bombs and they probably averaged about 150 to 200 tons a day 
when we had to do normal operations. But one, for one day, I think that was a record. And they I reckon see what it was. But I did explain to you, too, that the, there were so many bombs on the ship that uh, the ship wasn't designed to handle that many bombs. And uh, so they would take all the benches out of the mess hall and we sat on bombs when we ate. <laughs> they, they would have um, uh, three bombs, 500 pounders. It would be three on a dolly. And they were very lumpy to sit on. And then the, there were the two... 1,000 pounders, which were a lot more of an angle that didn't hurt your tush when you sat on it. And, and then there was the 2,000 pounder, which was, we called it the couch, which uh, if you were lucky enough to get one, you sat on them and three guys could sit on it comfortably uh, as though it was a bench and you, you ate. And these bombs would come and go as you're eating, you'd pick up, your, they'd tell you to go, move your tray and they'd move the bombs out and they'd go up on the flight deck and whatever. And uh, that's what it was. There was bombs all over the place. Yeah. So for the record, the 2,000 pounder was the most comfortable. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> well, um, you know, everyone, uh, the World War II guys always brag that the Navy had the best food. Uh, does that hold true for the Vietnam era? Well, I, I know I never ate army food, but uh, all, all, all my friends, I guess, I guess it must have been pretty bad, um, especially some of them that were you know, in the jungles so much time, but uh, food was okay. I mean, it was, if we, I mean, it, it, it's okay if you like dehydrated things. Uh, people think, well, you just, you know, all our milk was dehydrated, all our potatoes and, and things like that were all dehydrated. And, and it was uh, nice when you went to port, when you visited a port, all fresh things were there. So for two or three days after you left, like if we went to Hong Kong for, for a day or two and go back at least two or three days on the way back from Hong Kong, we'd have fresh things. So you, you had real eggs, not dehydrated eggs and real milk and, and, and that stuff and, and real potatoes instead of dehydrated potatoes. So, uh, but the food, they, I think the cooks did a great job. They, they always tried to make meals out of it. And uh, you know, a kid from Brooklyn, I didn't know what how many grits were until I got in the Navy. And the, after a while I started to really like how many grits. <laughs> Was your wife ever able to send you uh, any type of care package oh, on yeah. board? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Quite a few times. We, she'd send me uh, <clears throat> probably once a month. I, I'd get a package from her that had uh, canned, uh, uh, you know, stuff that I grew up with that I liked and, uh, you know, roasted peppers and tuna fish and, and uh, you know, things like that and, and, and you know, and, and then we would always share it between the friends and, and, and uh, a lot of the guys, especially um, from the Midwest, they would really get a kick out of some of the Italian stuff that my family would send me. And it was like really, really good. You know, they really loved it. And they looked forward to that Camp Patrick coming in. <laughs> um, um, what type of meat did you get? <laughs> from, from where? From, from Brooklyn. <laughs> oh, well, well, yeah, well, I, I didn't. Let's see, the meats, I think a few times, um, my wife sent me pepperoni, oh. which was okay. And I, I know uh, some of the other guys uh, had stories of uh, uh, family members sending salamis that were totally liquefied and things like that. But uh, we got it pretty quick. So it, pepperonis were, were handled well in the mail system. So, and, and, and people that from the Midwest never knew what pepperoni was and they, they actually loved it with a little provolone cheese. It was a good tasting meal. Ah, nice, nice. Was there anything though? Um, well, actually here's a question here. Um, I've got uh, two. Um, during your uh, cruise, were you over there for Christmas or any of the holidays? Um, no, let's see, holidays. Thanksgiving at sea, yes. Uh, uh, Christmas, no, because we, in 68, we came back a week before Christmas uh, from, uh, and we got back to Norfolk. I had, had uh, uh, leave on arrival and uh, I was able to get off the ship. And um, yeah, but Thanksgiving, uh, I, I was on the bridge and this was coming home. We st still were at sea. We were, at that time, I think we were just around the south coming through the, the Magellan Straits and it was Thanksgiving. And uh, I couldn't get to the mess hall because I had a watch, a four hour watch of the bridge. So 
by the time my four hours were over, uh, they ran out of turkey and uh, they had no turkey. So that Thanksgiving of 1968, I ate Franken beans. Uh, I was lucky enough to get the Franken beans, by the way. <laughs> but every, every holiday since we were home, went back and the America was supposed to, when we got back in 68, December, we were supposed to have about a 30 day rest, take some minor repairs and leave again. And, and that's when I was like, my God, you know, was, I'm never gonna see, you know, this is gonna be the end of me, uh, another year at sea. But what happened was the, the ship was damaged. Uh, we, we had our bent shaft or something that was, so they were gonna repair it. And then they decided once we got into Portsmouth Naval Shipyard for repairs, uh, they decided to update the bomb assembly rooms and stuff I, I talked about that, that the ship, couldn't handle the amount of bombs. So it was converted to handle the next problem. Yeah. And uh, so I, it never left Norfolk, Portsmouth again while I was on it. When I, I left in July, January, 1970, it was leaving for its second Vietnam cruise, but I was not part of it because <clears throat> I was being discharged. Uh -huh. Well, tell us a little bit about the, uh, the trip home. Uh, the trip home was um, kind of almost non-eventful, except when we we were we were told we were going to continue circling the world, and uh, instead of going back the way we came, we were going to continue to circle the globe, and uh, and we were going to stop in Sydney, Australia, and uh, New Wellington, New Zealand, and then go around that horn I was telling you about with the bed weather, and, and go hit Rio for the second time and go back home. And that would have been completing circling the world. And the, uh, uh, we, we got to uh, Sydney and um, we had to moor at um, Sydney Harbor with famous opera Senate air in Sydney Harbor. And, and, and we had to moor to a buoy and there was no dock that could take us that big an aircraft carrier. So uh, we, detached one of our anchors uh, and put a giant shackle at the end and lowered the shackle. And I was one of the six people picked to be in the whale boat by the buoy to moor the ship to the buoy. And we had a, a pin for the shackle. The pin weighed about 200 pounds. And we were told by the ship's bosun who was on the whale boat with us, don't drop it. This is the only one we have. And that day was very choppy and windy. And I think they probably should have postponed it, but they didn't. So we're on this whale boat rocking and rolling, the wind and the waves and all that. And we're trying to get this pin, this 200 pound pin through the hole of the shackle and one attempt, two attempt, three attempt. By the fourth attempt, we dropped it. And uh, it fell to the bottom and uh, we were in trouble at that point. So. I mean, we were cursed at the ship's bosun was so mad. Oh. And uh, we ended up uh, tying cable mm -hmm. instead of the pin. And we were disciplined. We had to keep watch. Us six guys had to share the watch 24 hours a day while we were in Sydney, Australia, at that buoy in a whale boat. Watch and call up to the bridge and give them readings of the buoy. Now, and that was our punishment for doing that. But <laughs> we, when we did leave Sydney, we arrived in um, Wellington, New Zealand, and I was at the bridge again, and the captain got a phone call from the mayor of Wellington telling us not to come into port. And uh, the captain put them on hold, put it on speakerphone so everyone in the bridge could hear the conversation. And... The mayor of Wellington tells the captain, we will not have any police. There will be no whale boat, no, no tugboats, no, no EMS, no police, nothing. All the stores will be closed. Don't bother coming into Wellington. And he explained the anti-war movement. They were protesting the USS America being in Wellington. Even though New Zealand was in the war with us, they had soldiers in Vietnam fighting with us, but they didn't want us there. And um, the captain uh, 
by the way, his name was Captain Rumble. He had a very appropriate name. That wasn't a made up name. That was his real name, Rumble, Miss Richard Rumble. And uh, he just got so mad. He just said, I want every man on this ship to step ashore in New Zealand. And uh, he left the bridge. And everybody looked around like, what are we gonna do, what are we gonna do? So we ended up anything that floated, we put people on, we anchored off of, off, off of uh, Wellington uh, Bay and shuttled 24 hours a day, the crew. And if you just stepped on it, <clears throat> on the land, you want everybody to put his foot on the land and then come back. And that's what we did for two and a half days. Wow. You know, it took that long. long. It took that long to get 5,000 people to do that. And, uh, and, and, and when we uh, got back, um, we left Wellington, the captain addressed the crew and told us why he did it. Because during World War II, he was a Navy pilot on the USS Lexington, which was sunk in the Battle of Midway. And he, he told us the Battle of Midway was protecting Australia and New Zealand from the invasion of Japan. And he mm -hmm. felt that New Zealand owed us a visit. And mm -hmm. he wasn't going to take it that we couldn't go. So that's what we did. That was on the way home. And, and, I, and th those words, I constantly recall, it sort of gave me a lump in my throat when he was speaking and telling us. And we actually went over, we sailed through the sinking places of the Battle of Midway. So we went over the sinking of the Lexington and it was, sits at the bottom of, of uh, and he Coral Sea, I guess that's the Coral Sea, yeah. Wow. Um, yeah. Well, you know, during the, you left as Tet was accelerating the pace of the war and you're headed back, you know, a lot changed on the American yes, home front at that time. A lot to change. How much the of war, it was, war, war intensified. Well, it was September 68 that the New Jersey got there uh, in, 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 in Yankee Station. So that added, um, a firepower uh, of it. And we were relieved by the USS John F. Kennedy. So when <laughs> Kennedy got there, we left and we were coming home. And uh, that's where, and, and the sentiment, now I didn't, you know, we did have a, a TV station to listen to if we wanted to. There were some things about anti-war stuff, but not until Wellington actually seen, uh, can realize, my God, this must be pretty bad if people in New Zealand are like this. But not until I got home in New Jersey when I actually feel the real brunt of that. So. I, I want to chat about that, but you did mention the New Jersey, and I was just curious: did you get to witness uh, her in action? Yes, yes, she was part of our flotilla, um, and uh, especially at night, uh, the skies would lay a light up, and uh, you knew that was New Jersey. Yes, uh, all the other when it, all the other aircraft carriers didn't shed too much light because most of his red lights and the engines would you see the glow of engines planes coming and going but that wasn't a glow. but when the new jersey was firing it lit up the sky and night hmm. really did unbelievable and the noise and you know that kind of thing i've got a question here um again from uh joseph um years after world war ii declassified papers revealed the seamanship after the battle of midway what examples of good seamanship can you talk about during your tour? Good seamanship, huh? Me personally? Sure. Yeah, or, yeah, or, know, other, just, uh, yeah. or the crew well, at well, large. Well, I, I would have to, you know, I, I just did what I was told. I was an, a nobody person. You, know, you just do anything on a ship just because you want to do it. You do it, you follow orders. But all I could say is <clears throat> all the senior officers, that I served with on the America were all World War II senior officers. And they were young men during World War II, but now they were the senior. They were the commanders and, and the full captains. And you know, a ship like the America has more than one rank of a captain, but there's only one ship's captain. So people, it confuses people when they know that. And it is the captain ship, but they are so, um, my, my division officer who was a commander, he was an old timer guy from World War II and, 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 and the respect and the knowledge that these guys had, 
fearless, fearless people. And, you know, mm-hmm. nothing would ever get in their way. And then for the idea, that little story I said about Wellington, you know, here it is, you know, the captain of the ship just saying, okay, what you tell me when I strike, we're going to make do. We're the United States Navy and, and, and we don't need you. And, and I loved it. And I still do. So seamanship, you know, the, my division, we had a ship's bosun who a bosun on a, on a big ship is the person in charge of all seaworthy things. He's in charge of all the bosun mate divisions and he's a, he's a warrant officer. He's a lifer. He at the time was probably in 25 years at the time, but so much knowledge. Those are the people that tell everybody else what to do. Okay. And you just, you act like you know it all, but you really don't because you're told to do it. Hope that answers the question. I thought, well, talk about a little bit more about coming home. You know, what was the transition like out of the Navy and back into home life uh, being a veteran? Yeah. We're coming home, hitting um, the anti war movement in Newark Airport uh, was kind of a, an experience that, that um, it, you know, what was going on there? It, we, I was on a flight. It was Allegheny Airlines. <clears throat> I had to leave on arrival when we got back. And uh, that uh, we got on a plane from Newark, uh, uh, Norfolk Airport, and it was an Allegheny Airlines prop plane. I guess there was like 50 people, 50 passengers. It was all military, Marines, Navy, Army, Air Force, everybody's on it. And everybody's going home for Christmas because it was a week before Christmas. And uh, we land in Newark Airport, and the stewardess tells us that there are demonstrators in the terminal and that we have to keep an eye out. She's letting us know that to expect some troublemakers. Now, we really didn't know what it is. So there was no jetway. There was just ro- stairways with wheels that would just roll up to the plane. And the stewardess guided us down those steps. We all walked behind her. She walked up to the building and there was a steel door and she said, you ready guys? And she opened the door and there was this mass confusion of yelling, screaming, cursing, spitting, everything you can imagine of people that wanted to actually do something nasty to you. And uh, you know, we had to not be uh, pushed into getting into a, a physical altercation. Uh, you wanted to get home. You didn't want to get arrested. You didn't want to get in trouble. And and that's what was on. And they would try to block you. And 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 I do remember the yelling and screaming. Their 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 face would be so close to yours that the saliva from them yelling would spray in your face. And it, it wasn't a good feeling. And they followed us. My wife and my father-in-law met me at the airport, and uh, uh, they followed us to the car where my father was parked. That's, that's how antagonistic they were, really amazing. But uh, getting home though, once it was home, I, I really didn't pay much attention to it. And uh, um, you know, getting in back into civilian life was, was a problem because guys my age at that time was when you got out of high school, you weren't going to college, you couldn't get a job because most jobs wouldn't hire you because you had to be serve your draft or you're going to do something to join some military and then when you got back home the same thing applied because nobody wanted to hire me because they felt that all vietnam veterans were drug drug addicts or baby killers so we had that to deal with too so i went to a headhunter and and asked him you know i I can't get an interview for a job and he said he looked at my resume and he told me oh here it is you're telling Corporate America, you're a Vietnam veteran. You have to take that out. And I said, you're kidding me. You have to take it out. He says, yes, you have to take it out. I reluctantly took it out and I started to get interviews. And all, all through my work experience, I never mentioned that I was a Vietnam vet to any coworker or nothing. It, you just didn't do it. You just didn't pay attention. Just try to do your job and it'll give people some impressions that were not right. About how many years after till you started talking about it openly? In your experience? Uh, well, not until I got to the memorial, to be honest with you. Uh, and I just, you know, it was built and, you know, I don't live far away from it. And, and I never went there. And it wasn't until 2006 uh, that uh, one day I said, I'm going to take a ride and see what it's all about. So I got up there and there was a school visiting. 
And there were tour guides breaking up classes and walking them through. So I tagged along. Nobody questioned me who I was. Or, you know, I, I wasn't part of the school. I wasn't part of the memorial. And I walked with this group of kids. And 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 there was a tour guide. Uh, his name was John. He's no longer around. I don't see him. And he gave this thing, and I said, "Wow, this is an amazing thing." And 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 then I did speak to him, and he said, "Well, you should you should go ask uh, so and so to." come in here and and I did and talked to her and uh I think Katie was her name and uh I uh I started to volunteer and and that's when I started to talk more about it uh, and a lot of guys did the same thing I've got a question here going going back a little um back to the war uh, it's from Mike um uh, Mike Sapera we know him. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I was attached to the Brownwater Navy, he says, uh, in Vietnam. It was very dangerous. Joe, could you expand about being on a carrier with the armament? I don't think people realize the danger. I have great respect to my brothers in arms in the Navy. Oh, well, thanks, Mike. Um, one who's attached to the Brownwater Navy, totally different. For those of the people who don't know the Brownwater Navy, they were uh, 50 50 foot uh, speed boats that uh, were aluminum and uh, he would uh, run through the wetlands of Vietnam and uh, do some amazing things. Uh, one of the most dangerous jobs in the Vietnam War was to be on those boats. But armament, uh, besides having all these missiles on these planes we had and, and, and the bombs and, and uh, we also, we had nuclear weapons. Uh, we never used them, thank God, but they were nuclear weapons. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, if, if a war ever started, a carrier has to be a major uh, uh, point of uh, that war. And we were in a war zone, so you always have to be prepared for the worst. So we were always prepared for the worst. Um, you know, cannon fire, the guns that's up, there were guns on, big guns on the ship too. So, uh, um, yeah, most of our defense was the planes if we had, but we never were attacked by anything to do that. I've got a question here from uh, Rick. Um, this is Joe, Rick here. Was your neighborhood uh, back home in Brooklyn good to Vietnam vets in general? Did you attempt to join any vet organizations prior to coming here? Yes, I. Uh, when I did get out, um, my father <clears throat> was a World War II vet. He served in the Army's first division in Europe and uh, when I got out, he said, you know what, I mean, you should get you into my VFW group. And uh, so uh, I went with him. He brought me to a meeting in Brooklyn. I forget what section it was near Ocean Parkway. I think it was near the Midwood section of Brooklyn, if I could recall. And uh, he introduced me to the commander of the uh, uh, chapter. And uh, they had a big meeting. There were probably 150 people in, in the room. And uh, so we all sat down, commanded, um, called the meeting to attention, and we, we got the Pledge of Allegiance and all that. And then he went into his thing where he said, my father, my father's name was Phil. Phil Rosado has uh, brought his son here, and I would like to introduce you to him. Uh, he served in the war we lost. And I couldn't believe what he said. And it was, it, I was astonished. Like, this is a VFW and, and, and I, and a lot of the guys at the memorial, we run in, I run into a few people that have had that. The World War II generation didn't really think very much of the Vietnam uh, war vets when we got back uh you know i guess we were disgraced and and they didn't want any part of us and we lost the war we didn't win the war but you know there was so much difference in the world events you know the rules of engagement the, all those reasons why we did what we did wasn't anything we controlled you know world war ii wasn't a political war vietnam war to me was run by the politicians and it could have ended a lot quicker but it wasn't up to us were there ever any times in your service when you were on ship and with all those bombing operations that you thought, are we really doing the right thing to sort of question how we were going about fighting it? Yeah, I, I, 
I, I think I felt that we were doing the right thing. I mean, a lot of it was red, repetition, repetition, because we were, you know, I'd say 90% of our bombing was the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And, uh, and, and it, you know, how much bombs could you drop? I mean, if you, you look at history now, you read about the Vietnam War, more bombs were dropped in Vietnam than all of World War II, the entire world. One little country the size of New Jersey. I mean, it, it's just amazing. And, you know, how many bombs do you do? And, uh, you know, um, over and over and over again, but we were bombing places because we had no other routes. To, we couldn't really bomb targets that the commanders on the field or the admirals or the captains on the ship really wanted to bomb. We had to bomb what headquarters told us to bomb. And, and that's where the mistake was made. Mm -hmm. You know, being on the bridge, did you ever get to hear any of like the post bombing briefings or when people would report the results to the admiral or the officers? Well, the pilots had their own briefing rooms for that, but I, I would be at the bridge many times where pilots would have reconnaissance photos um, and, and, and show the captain and the admiral that the, our bombing the night before damaged the Ho Chi Minh Trail here and they had photographs of it and they're already the Viet North Vietnamese constructed a bridge or dug around the damage and supplies were now flowing again. So all we had to do was move our bombing 50 yards to the west and they weren't allowed to do that without getting approval. So they would get that red phone I spoke of before, pick it up and ask for permission. And somebody in Honolulu would say, no, they said, you, you, you only do this latitude, this longitude, this where and that, and you don't do anything else. And that's what happened. You know, um, I'm sure pilots were discouraged. Um, reconnaissance pictures all the time, all the time. Oh, wow. wow. Well, I'm going to ask some of our vet chat stock questions because I, I think they're fun. <laughs> but um, uh, for our audience out there, uh, Joe is the author of an incredible book, Coming of Age Story. The Vietnam War is one of the main themes to sort of run, run through his uh, coming of age narrative, Voices Over Troubled Water. And if you want to hear more about Joe's time in Brooklyn and, and Vietnam, um, it's on uh, Amazon. You can check it out. But uh, Joe, one of the things that's wonderful in your book is you mentioned so many of, so much of the great music uh, of the era. And is there, um, is there a song that you associate with the Vietnam War and your service? So many of them. <clears throat> You know, uh, I, 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 I think at the time I wasn't a, a Beatle fan, uh, but when I wrote that book, by that time I became a Beatle fan. So, you know, I, I could say Beatle songs, there's quite a few of them, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, they, 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 there's a lot of music, I, 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 I you know, a song itself, I can't put a, a tag on, on a, a song or two that I would, I, I love the artists themselves. So, you know, at that time, you know, Gary Puckett in the Union Gap was a popular, popular uh, singer, um, uh, you know, things like that, but it didn't have much time to pay attention to music. Um, yeah. That way, did the ship, you know, did the ship you know, ever play anything on the sound speakers or? Yeah, we, we had a, we had a radio station, um, we had a couple of radio stations, but you know, it was, you know, guys that would hang out and play cards all day, uh, you know, and there were people that would just skaters that knew what to do to get out or go to work. But I felt that, you know, I, I was there to pass the time as fast, as fast as I could. So I, I would never shy away from volunteering for something and doing something because it made the time go by quicker. It made me forget about where I had to be. And uh, so, but there were there were there was a radio. I think it was three three radio stations we had, and there was one that took requests. Uh, and we had a news show too, TV news show that was produced on the ship. Uh, it's amazing. You think about it. You know. I've got a question here from Michael. It says, "Would you do it all again?" Uh, I I think I probably would. I think I would. Uh, you know, 
over exactly the same way. I'd have to modify a couple of things here or there, but you know, I feel that uh, it's it it, it 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 taught me a lot of life. And if I didn't do it, I, I think I would be a different person. Um, and I, I think I did mention it to you in, in our in our interview that uh, you know I was so impressed with the logistics of of the U.S. Navy of, of being in an exact place at an exact time in a godforsaken spot of the world. And there it is, you're rendezvousing with supplies and, and fuel. And, and, and it's so much impressed me that I said, you know what, I, I, I just, and I was tending before that to be in logistics and, and it was just amplified that this is something I wanna do. And I, I did, I pursued it. Yeah. Um, a, 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 a good comment here from uh, Joseph again. I suggest to promote his book that he contacts student veteran association groups on campus. Uh, our group in Bergen County has a periodic uh, discussion groups and readings. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I've been to a lot of those. You know, that book is uh, now seven years old. Uh, I've been to a lot of events like that. Uh, now, it's not a new book for those of people that don't realize it, but, uh, you know, I think the idea of, uh, I never told the story what made me write the book. Uh, yeah. uh, let, what let inspired it? Yeah, we, 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 we had that story. I, the memorial contacted me uh, seven years ago uh, to say a few words, happy birthday to the U.S. Navy on its 239th birthday. And, uh, you know, I didn't, when I first got the memo, the email, I, I, I wasn't going to go with my, my partner, Maureen, said, no, you're crazy. We have to do that. This is great. It's at Caesar's Palace, and, and this is where it's going to be. And I said, okay, I'll go. We, we went. I accepted the, 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 the role. And when we got to Caesar's Palace, um, we found out that the event was in the main ballroom. And we, went, we got dressed. They gave me a suite. I, and I realized something must be wrong. Why are they giving me a suite at Caesar's Palace in Atlantic City? And I'm only gonna say happy birthday US Navy. I should have known something was up, but I just played dumb, went down, we got dressed, we walked into the registration desk and this had over 500 place cards on the table and they had these Navy people, you give them your name and they go find your card. And so there was this Navy chief a woman there standing there. She asked me, what's your name? I gave her my name and she's all, oh, you're sitting at the head table. And I said, wow, head table? This is something strange. Why would they want me at the head table? And I'm only gonna say, you know, okay. And they sit me at the head table. So <clears throat> my girlfriend, Maureen, opens up the place setting and there's a program for the night. And it said, keynote speaker was Tommy Lasorda, Baseball Hall of Famer from the Los Angeles Dodgers, Brooklyn Dodgers, all that. So I said, wow, this is going to be an amazing night. I'm going to, and I'm at the head table. He's probably going to sit at this table. I can get some nice stories about baseball. And uh, then all of a sudden, somebody taps me on the shoulder and says, uh, the captain wants to meet you, who was running the event. His name was Captain Valentine. And uh, I get up, I go to Captain Valentine, and uh, I, I tell him, wow, this is amazing. You have... Tommy Lasorda here, this is, this is going to be really good. And he says, well, Sailor, Tommy couldn't make it tonight. You are the keynote speaker. And, and, and I said, what? Keynote speaker? He says, you are going to be no keynote speaker. You have a problem with that, Sailor? Just like the captain would say. And I said, no. He handed me a sheet of paper. He says, is this your bio? I looked at it quickly. Yeah, it's my bio. He says, well, I'm going to introduce you in three minutes. And that was it. I was introduced. I got up to the head podium, giant screen behind me. And uh, I'm staring at the audience of all military civilians, base commanders from the tri-state area. And I said, my little happy birthday speech wasn't gonna be good enough for this group. So I decided to tell them a story of my, my cruise around the world and serving in Vietnam on the USS America. And, 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 and I got a standing ovation. And yeah. when I was finished, I got back to my table. I, and there was a line of people that wanted to shake my hand. 
and wanted to thank me for what I said and what Vietnam veterans did for these people. These were active duty people who said that the Vietnam veterans paved the way for them. And they wanted to thank. And it took me a long time to shake all those hands that were right behind me. And that is what provoked me to write my book. We, thinking of uh, speaking to younger veterans and to uh, the younger generation who, like yourself, might not, you know, a, a more prehistoric version of yourself, <laughs> couldn't find Vietnam on a map. Um, what what do you hope that future generations know and understand about that moment in our history? Well, I, I hope history isn't forgotten, and and you know the old saying, you know we. You know, history repeats itself, and I, I wouldn't want a bad thing like a war like that to repeat itself. So knowing what happened, uh, I know all, all the kids that uh, I've given tours to um, get that sentiment from me that, uh, you know, war isn't a good thing. It's a, it's a bad thing, but if you have to do it, you have to do it, but do it the right way um, and and try to make it that not everybody has to be in war, uh, you know, like the Vietnam veterans have been responsible for fixing the corrupt draft system this country had, okay? It went from a corrupt system to a little better system and then was eliminated. And, and the young students today uh, that we saw didn't realize what the draft was. Uh, and, and, and if they had that hanging over their head, they, it would be different life for them. And and you know, I them them understanding that is a big thing, and I and 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 that's what was conveyed to me in Atlantic City that night. That those guys were volunteers because they wanted to be there, and mm -hmm. and 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 we are a country that can actually do what we do with a volunteer service is amazing. Yeah, well, I think this will be our last question for the night. Um, we're going to get back to uh, uh, shore leave here. <laughs> Uh, did you Navy guys get any R and R? So do you have a do you have a a, a favorite uh, or fond memory of some time ashore? Well, or were you lucky enough to even get off the boat? <laughs> one way we did get off. It, it, to some of the other guys in the army, you could, you were able to get R and R where you left your unit and you went to Hawaii or you went to wherever. But in the Navy, it doesn't work that way. You stay with your ship. So you don't get you don't get R and R. The ship will go to a place, a port, and you would have a day or two at that port, but it isn't really R and R. Uh, uh, it, 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 it's a lot different. You don't leave, and nobody could say, "I I, I want to go to Hawaii," and you put your papers in. They're going to approve you to go to Hawaii. No, it ain't going to happen. <laughs> I wish it did. No, a lot different than uh, most other military uh, uh, branches. Mm. Did you have a favorite port that you visited? Well, yeah, I, I guess my favorite was Sydney, Australia. Um, just to, you know, if you got a, if we got time. It, we, oh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I had, at the time, I had a, a friend that I made on the ship. He was from Belmore, Queens, and uh, he was a good guy. And uh, we would go on ashore together. And, and we were in, the, and, and we always had to wear our uniforms in these countries because we, you can never take your uniform off. So, and the difference between Australia and New Zealand was completely different. They loved us. Australia loved us to be there. And we're walking down the street, downtown Sydney, Australia, skyscrapers, like Rockefeller Center in Manhattan. And this two women walk over to us and they say, you know, they introduce themselves, they ask us where we're from. And as soon as we said we were from New York, they said, oh my God, New York, you, we have to bring you upstairs. And and upstairs, where's I so we 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 run an animation company and we want you to come up and I want to introduce you to the team. So we go in this skyscraper 60 floors up and we get there and they were an animation company that made, they distributed the, um, a cartoon, I call it a cartoon, it was like an adult cartoon. It was called The King and His Court and it was on television at the time. It was a, a popular show and it was all produced there. and. And, and they had these panoramic windows all around the place. It was the top floor of the building. And, and, and I remember looking out and the sky was turning black and brown. And, and oh my God, we had a big storm. Comes, oh, no, no, that's not a storm. 
that's mating season for the kangaroos. And there was hundreds and hundreds of kangaroos with the dust and the small, it looked like it was going to be a thunderstorm, a major, major storm. That's how much dust they made. So that was funny. But the warmth and the openness of the Australians were just amazing. We'd go to a bar, walk in a bar, and you never had to pay for a drink if you were in uniform in Australia. People mm -hmm. always picked up the check. And I can't say that about New Zealand. Uh Michael Cole adds a uh, good sentiment here. The friends we've made as a result of that war. Yes, yes. <laughs> well, uh, thank you so much, Joe, for sharing uh, tonight. Um, and again, to our audience, we, we really did only scratch, I'm holding his book up here. Uh, we really only scratched the surface. Uh, a lot of great uh, sea stories, but also just uh, growing up in Brooklyn uh, at that that very critical crossroads in our national history. Uh, so check it out. Um, I just wanna thank uh, all of our veteran volunteers, of course, for their service uh, then and now, um, keeping the memory and the legacy alive. And thank you to our board for their support in making these programs uh, possible. Uh, thanks tonight, especially to uh, Jillian Decker uh, for all of her support behind the scenes and uh, and in these past couple of years uh, in creating programs like this and to carry uh, Giannotti, uh, uh, Bloomfield High's finest uh, out there who might might be lurking in the uh, behind the scenes and Sarah Taggart as well, our executive director. Uh, we're gonna shake it up a bit. Uh, November, of course, is Veterans Day. And uh, I think for our next vet chat, uh, we'd like to do a special uh, Veterans Day uh, program. Maybe we'll have more than one uh, guest speaker, maybe explore some different uh, themes about what it means to be a Vietnam veteran uh, then and now. Uh, stay tuned. We'll keep our audience uh, updated on social media about what our plans are for the next one. And, but that will be on next third Thursday, which would be November 18th. Uh, and again, there will be the survey here at the end. If you have more questions for Joe, we'll make sure he gets them. Uh, that'll pop up. Uh, down at the bottom. And of course, in, in Facebook, you'll get the link there. Uh, and I want to just shout out to uh, our audience again. Thank you for your participation. And there was um, there was a gentleman uh, by the name of Joseph who asked a number of questions. And I mentioned a group in Bergen. And I'm just adding for my own uh, curatorial sake, I would love to know more about your young veterans group. Um, so send us, uh, send us some info. Maybe there's some uh, possibilities and uh, partnership things to explore there. Uh, and of course, we're here uh, for you as well. So uh, thank you for your service. Uh, so uh, thank you again, Joe. Welcome home and uh, have a good night. Thank you. Thank you.